Hi, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 11, Mechanisms of Microbial Genetics. This is the first chapter of our second unit of the course. And this chapter is all about the genetic material that brings about the structures and the functions for not only microbes, but all living organisms, which is DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And um, as you've probably learned before, DNA is the genetic material uh, for all living organisms, and that includes microbes, except for some viruses. Uh, and the exceptions to this will be discussed in a subsequent chapter when we talk about acellular pathogens. But for right now, to get your brains going, what I want you to do in this very first checkpoint is draw me a molecule of DNA in as much detail as you can remember. You've probably learned something about DNA before. Um, and this, this drawing doesn't have to be terribly detailed, but this is just a thought exercise to try to see what you remember about DNA. Um, so draw me, draw me a molecule, label it as needed. Um, your drawing will not be graded on accuracy. It will be graded based upon what you can recall out of your brain. So hopefully you came up with something that looks like a molecule of DNA, but if you didn't, that's okay, because our first item of business in this lecture is going to be uh, reviewing what is the structure of DNA. After that, we are going to briefly discuss how DNA is packaged in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and then we will move on um, to spend the majority of this lecture talking about what DNA's essential functions are. So we'll start by talking about what the structure of DNA is. DNA is an extremely tiny but extremely long molecule, and that's because it is more or less a chain that is made up of individual units called nucleotides. So these nucleotides are really tiny. Um, they are on the order of nanometers in diameter, but when you put large amounts of them together in a, in a chain linked together, then you get the very long molecule that is DNA. So to give you some perspective, um, the DNA that is in every single one of our cells, if you took it out and you laid it end on end and stretched it all out, it would be three meters in length, but only two nanometers in diameter. So it's a very long, thin molecule. And the building blocks in this chain are called nucleotides, which is what you see on the screen right here. This whole thing is a nucleotide. And so when you get lots of these that are stuck together with each other, um, that produces the long chain molecule known as DNA. As you can see, within an individual nucleotide, there are a few different parts, which are color-coded and labeled here for you. First of all, on the left, we have a phosphate group. Phosphate group is named for the fact that it contains phosphorus. Then in the middle, we have a sugar. This sugar is specifically the sugar deoxyribose. And this is just another type of sugar. It's like glucose, sucrose, lactose, um, but it's not a sugar that we generally think about eating. Um, it's deoxyribose. And then finally, over on the right, we have a nitrogenous base. And um, the nitrogenous base can be one of four different things within any given link of the chain. So there are four different possible nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine which are usually just designated with their first letter A, G, C, or T. This nitrogenous base up here, you can see, um, is, is labeled adenine, but in any given nucleotide, this nitrogenous base can be any one of these four things. The phosphate group is always the same, the sugar is always the same, but the nitrogenous base can vary. So as I said, what you're seeing here is only one nucleotide, but DNA is composed of literally billions of these that are linked together in a long string. And so the linkage um, of these two nucleotides, two or more nucleotides, uh, has a special name. It's called a phosphodiester bond. Phosphodiester bond is the joining of two nucleotides between the sugar of one and the phosphate group of another. And this occurs through a special type of chemical reaction called a condensation reaction, or um, a, in other words, a dehydration reaction. Those are uh, synonyms for each other. And the resulting bond that is created between the adjacent nucleotides is called a phosphodiester bond. So right here, of course, we see two nucleotides that have been linked together. 
we can see that the phosphate groups are identical in each of them, the sugars are identical in each of them, but they have different nitrogenous bases because remember those nitrogenous bases can vary. Of course, realistically, DNA molecules are much longer than this. So let's take a look at what it might look like to build a DNA molecule from scratch here. So here we are looking at a cartoon of a single nucleotide. Again, we've got a phosphate group, a sugar, and the nitrogenous base. This nitrogenous base is labeled for us A, which indicates clearly that it is adenine. When we add a second nucleotide to this chain, now we have a phosphodiester bond right here between the phosphate and the sugar. Now we have a two nucleotide long piece of DNA. And if we keep building this out, then eventually we get something that looks more like one strand of a DNA molecule. And once again, we can see that the phosphate groups and the sugars are all identical across each nucleotide. The nitrogenous bases vary. We've got adenine, cytosine, guanine, thiamine, but the sugar and the phosphate group are always the same. And so this alternating chain of sugar and phosphate groups is called the backbone of the DNA molecule. So what you're looking at here now is one full strand of a molecule of DNA. But you probably learned at some point that DNA is not a single-stranded molecule. It's actually a double-stranded molecule. And what this means is that every single strand of DNA found in your cells does not exist solo, but rather paired with a second strand that is a perfect complement to it. And the sense in which it is a perfect complement is in the sequence of nitrogenous bases that exactly line up between the two strands. Thymine and adenine, these two nitrogenous bases, have a special attraction to each other. They are always attracted to each other by two hydrogen bonds, which link them. And you can see this at the very top. These little dotted lines here between the A and the T are meant to be the hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine, or G and C, are attracted to each other by three separate hydrogen bonds, which you can see in the second pairing down here. These three little dotted lines represent the attraction between G and C. And so these two strands are held together by a perfect pairing of the sequence of their nitrogenous bases here, which are attracted to each other in a highly specific way. And of course, um, when you've seen DNA molecules drawn, they probably didn't look like this, laid out all flat. They probably looked like this. And this is the same thing that you see on the left. Um, it's as if you took the ladder that you see on the left and you just twisted it around itself into a shape that is referred to as the double helix. So although this is an accurate representation of the internal chemistry of a DNA molecule, um, inside of living cells, this picture actually looks a lot more like this, the double helix shape, because the molecule twists. Another thing that you may have noticed about these two strands of DNA um, is that while the strand on the left, all of the letters are pointing towards you, upright in the correct direction, the ones on the left has all the letters shown upside down. Um, and that was not a mistake, that was done for a reason. The reason is that the two complementary strands of DNA are anti-parallel to each other. So the word parallel means side by side, right? Um, and, and these strands are side by side, but they are side by side in opposite directions. So in other words, where the left strand starts with a phosphate group, the right strand starts with the sugar in the backbone. And so there's, if you can look on, on one strand, you can always predict how the opposite strand will end. If it starts with a phosphate group on strand one, then it should start with a sugar on strand two. They run in opposite directions, and that is how they achieve these attractions and this pairing. There are special designations given to the phosphate group end and the sugar end of the backbones of the DNA molecule. So the phosphate group is specifically designated the five prime end of the molecule. So in this picture, for example, um, in the strand on the left, the top is the five prime end and the bottom of the right is the five prime end. The sugar is designated the three prime end. And so the three prime end in the left molecule is the end at the bottom and on the right molecule, it is the end at the top.
These designations are going to become important when we discuss the essential functions of DNA, like DNA replication and transcription and translation. So these numbers were assigned to the phosphates and the sugars just to keep the different ends of the DNA molecule straight, and you will see why they become important momentarily. Before we start to talk about those essential functions of DNA, though, um, we are going to briefly talk about how DNA is packaged in the two major classifications of cells recognized in biology, which are the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells have a single large circular chromosome of DNA that is complemented by much smaller but also circular plasmids, which are represented on here. Um, first of all, the large chromosome is this big red loop, and the smaller plasmids are these little blue loops. Both are stored in an area of the cytoplasm of the cell called the nucleoid region, which you may recall from unit one is just a space inside of the cell. It is not walled off from any other part of the cell by a membrane or a barrier. It is just a spot where the DNA hangs out inside of the prokaryotic cell. We can contrast this to eukaryotic cells, which instead of having a single circular chromosome, they have multiple linear chromosomes. And those chromosomes uh, have to be highly supercoiled around special proteins called histones, which allows eukaryotic cells to store their DNA in a very compact manner. That DNA storage takes place inside of the structure known as the nucleus, which differs from the nucleoid region in the fact that it is walled off from the rest of the cell by a double layer of membranes, and so it is like a compartment that protects the DNA, whereas the prokaryotes do not have such a compartment, they just have a space. So at this point, we have covered our first two questions, which is what is the structure of DNA and how is DNA packaged in the two major types of cells? And we're going to move on to our discussion of DNA's essential functions. DNA has two essential functions in living organisms, and those are that it serves as the molecule of inheritance and that it serves as the blueprint. In its role as the molecule of inheritance, DNA is the molecule that carries information between generations. So DNA is physically passed down from parents to offspring, uh, and in that capacity, it serves as a blueprint for encoding information about all of the structures and functions that come about in an organism. And so related to these two essential functions are certain processes that DNA has to undergo. For example, in order to be the genetic material that, that is the molecule of inheritance, DNA has to be copied. It has to be accurately copied to make multiples of the same molecule so that those molecules can then be passed down to new generations. The process of making these copies is called DNA replication. And we are first going to discuss the details of how DNA replication works so that DNA can be passed down to new generations. After that, we're going to talk about how DNA serves as the blueprint for information about structures and functions. And in this capacity, in order to create structures in living organisms and to carry out functions, DNA has to be converted into proteins. So the information, the structures that are, that are encoded in a DNA molecule have to be used to produce specific proteins, um, like it, in humans, for example, um, keratin in your hair and nails, muscle tissue, bones, and that is how the information in DNA is carried out. The process of this happening is called transcription and translation. So we'll be talking about these processes too, but first we're going to discuss inheritance and the process of DNA replication that makes it possible. There is a specific step-by-step -step process that cells undergo in order to take one molecule of DNA and make an identical copy of that molecule. And so what we're going to do here is walk through step-by-step step how cells do this 
and how they carry out that process. The elegance of this process lies in the fact that a DNA molecule um, makes it actually rather easy to copy itself because it has a specific sequence of nitrogenous bases, A's, T's, G's, and C's, and the cell can always predict what should come across from a particular nitrogenous base because it knows that a T is always attracted to an A and a G is always attracted to a C. And so if this is our DNA molecule right here laid on its side, we've got two backbones and then we have our nitrogenous bases represented as the rungs of the ladder. What the cell wants to do is it wants to open up that molecule of DNA and it wants to read the sequence of nitrogenous bases of A's, T's, G's, and C's occurring along its length and then use that as a template to create a new molecule of DNA by predicting what should be across from each nitrogenous base. So the first step in making this happen is to open up that molecule of DNA. This is performed by a special enzyme called helicase. Helicase will find a site on the chromosome called the origin of replication, which is a specific location that has a sequence which attracts helicase to it. And then the helicase, once it finds this origin of replication, will move through and unzip the two strands from each other so that the subsequent nitrogenous bases can then be read. And I want you to tell me in our second checkpoint here, what types of bonds is helicase breaking when it pulls apart the two strands of DNA? So once the two strands have been partially pulled apart, the next essential step is for special proteins to enter the scene and attach to each of the separated strands to prevent them from rejoining. Because remember, these two strands are highly attracted to each other. They have pairing that causes them to want to zip back together. They've got a C here and a G here. They've got an A here and a T here. And those things are attracted to each other. They want to come back together. And to prevent that from happening, these binding proteins grab onto the strands and hold them apart to prevent them from rejoining. After that, you would think that the next logical step would be for the cell to then read the sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's in the nitrogenous bases here and here, and then use that as a template for making new DNA. The problem with that is that the enzyme which makes DNA actually does not know where to start in this sequence of letters. And so there's an intervening step here, um, which is dedicated to telling the DNA making enzyme where it needs to start along the length of this existing DNA. That step is carried out by an enzyme called primase. And primase's job is to create a little piece of RNA, which you may remember is DNA's cousin, called a primer on each of the DNA template strands. So primase will come on the scene and it will build a tiny piece of this molecule called RNA, or ribonucleic acid, which is referred to as a primer. And the purpose of this primer, as we mentioned, is to teach the DNA-making enzyme where it needs to start. One thing that is important to note about primase and indeed all subsequent enzymes that we're going to be talking about, is that they only work in one direction along these DNA strands. So primase can only start at the three prime end and move towards the five prime end on these DNA strands. So for example, on the top strand here, we see that the three prime end, the end with the sugar, is here at the top. And of course, opposite it at the other end of the molecule is the five prime end. And primase can only work in this direction, from the three prime towards the five prime. That presents some problems for the opposite strand here, of course, because the three prime end is over here, and the five prime end is over here. And so, of course, primase wants to work in this direction, 
But the molecule isn't fully unzipped yet. Helicase has not made it all the way to the end. So instead of going all the way to the end of this molecule, primase will get as far as it can, and then it will continue to work in this direction toward the 5' prime end of the molecule. So keep that in mind. Before we go further, though, I'm going to pose a checkpoint to you, which should largely be review. I want you to tell me what you remember about the differences between deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, and ribonucleic acid, or RNA. Come up with at least one difference between these two types of molecules. So there are several things that you could have come up with for that checkpoint. Perhaps the most common one that people remember is the fact that while DNA is always a double-stranded molecule, RNA, on the other hand, is a single-stranded molecule. But DNA and RNA also contain a different array of possible nitrogenous bases. So whereas the letters that may be found in a DNA molecule are C, G, A, and T, in an RNA molecule, those letters are C, G, A, and U. Instead of having the nitrogenous base thymine as one possible component of its nucleotides, RNA has the nitrogenous base uracil, which has a different structure than thymine um, and is more conducive to this single-stranded formation here. And so when we talk about the primase building a little RNA primer that attaches to the DNA, this is how the RNA would pair with the DNA. In the DNA, wherever there is a T, there will be an A across from it. But in the DNA, wherever there is an A, instead of there being a T, there will be a U across from it. Because RNA does not contain Ts, instead of Ts, it contains Us. So let's get back to the process here and summarize what we have so far. We've opened up the DNA molecule. Binding proteins have kept the strands apart. And primase has come in and paired this little temporary RNA primer with each of the DNA strands in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction in order to teach the DNA-making enzyme where it can start making DNA. Meanwhile, helicase is continuing to unzip the DNA molecules from each other. And as this happens, the DNA-making enzyme, called DNA polymerase 3, enters the scene it finds the primer, and it starts to build a new DNA molecule off the end of that RNA primer. It will continue to add nucleotides and extend the length of the DNA molecule, and it will work in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, just like primase did. So that means that on the top strand, DNA polymerase is moving in this direction, and on the bottom strand, it is moving in this direction. Another important function of DNA polymerase 3 is that after it creates the DNA, it will proofread its own work and correct any mistakes that it just made. So if we keep going with this process, then it should make sense that as helicase continues to unzip the DNA ladder, then DNA polymerase 3 is going to, on the top strand, just keep making more DNA as more DNA is revealed to it by helicase. That's not the case on the opposite strand, though, right? And that's because the opposite strand, we can see that DNA polymerase ran into the end here. And so while this strand can be replicated continuously, DNA polymerase can just keep on trucking in the same direction as helicase, therefore this is called the leading strand, this strand is running into some problems down here. This strand is called the lagging strand. So the lagging strand is the strand where DNA polymerase has to go in the opposite direction of helicase. While helicase is unwinding in this direction, DNA polymerase is making DNA in the opposite direction because the strands are anti-parallel to each other. And so on this second strand, on this lagging strand, what has to happen is primase has to come in and create a new primer even closer to the three prime end of the DNA 
And then DNA polymerase has to find that primer again and create a new piece of DNA. And this means that this lagging strand right here is replicated in chunks instead of continuously because everything has to go in the opposite direction of DNA helicase. It, the DNA is created piecewise as helicase reveals more DNA through this unzipping process. The spe uh, specific name for the fragments that are created on the lagging strand is called Okazaki fragments. So this chunk right here of DNA and RNA primer, that's called an Okazaki fragment. This is an Okazaki fragment. As the replication continues, the leading strand will be continuous and smooth, and the lagging strand will contain these Okazaki fragments. And this is a problem um, because on the lagging strand, you see that we're largely not composed of DNA. We, we've got a lot of RNA in there, right? And so there is another enzyme called DNA polymerase 1, which is dedicated to getting those RNA primers out of there and replacing them with pieces of DNA. So DNA polymerase 1 will hunt down those RNA primers, it will remove them, and it will replace them instead with pieces of DNA. There's one final step in this process that needs to be addressed, and I've highlighted for you where that step is pertinent here. So I've made sure that there are gaps present in the lagging strand here, um, because when DNA polymerase 1 removes the RNA primers and lays down DNA instead, what it fails to do is seal the gaps in the backbone between adjacent Okazaki fragments. And so ligase is an enzyme that comes in and it repairs those little nicks in the backbone and seals them up so that both strands of the DNA molecule are continuous. Now, as this process runs all the way to its completion, you can see that what you end up with are now where you started with a single molecule of DNA. Now you have two molecules of DNA, one on the top and one on the bottom. So that was kind of a slow step-by-step -step walkthrough of the process, um, but I really want to encourage everyone to go into the slides that are on Blackboard and also go to this YouTube link right here. This right here is an animation of the steps that we saw um, that runs through them seamlessly and continuously so that you can see how one step leads into the other. And I think it's really helpful to, to watch this animation and see how the process works in a movie rather than in static images like I just show you, showed you. So, so I highly recommend that you go into the slides, go to this YouTube link and check this out. One final detail that we want to address about this process of DNA replication um, is one of the terms that is used to describe it, which is semi-conservative. Semi-conservative is a word that is used to describe the fact that every molecule of DNA that comes out of DNA replication is actually half old, half new. So as we saw, each half of the new molecules of DNA is, consists of one old strand that was used as a template paired with one new strand that was synthesized to match it. And so it is in that sense that the process is semi-conservative. It, it somewhat conserves or preserves the old molecule of DNA in the new pieces that come out of the process. So let's do a checkpoint to review what we just learned. I want you to tell me what would happen to a cell that had a broken version of the enzyme helicase and do the same for the enzyme ligase. So what would happen if a cell had a non-working version of each of these two enzymes? So this completes our discussion about DNA replication, which explains how DNA plays a role in uh, inheritance. The next thing that we need to talk about is DNA's role as the blueprint molecule. Um, and to talk about how it serves as a structural and functional blueprint, then we need to discuss 
two connect, uh, connected processes called transcription and translation. So that's what we're going to do in the last part of this lecture here. So what we're going to be answering as we talk about transcription and translation is the question of how the information that is stored in DNA, um, the information that is found in that blueprint, put into action. And as we have this discussion, it is important to keep in mind that the way that transcription and translation works is based upon the fact that DNA is the one single master copy of information that the cell has. So the analogy that I like to work with here is like DNA is a library full of books that teach the cell how to do things and how to make things. And if there was only one library in the entire world, it probably would not be a good idea to let people check books out of that library um, for obvious reasons, right? Because people could damage the books or they could not bring them back. And so if DNA is the one and only library of information inside of the cell, then it makes sense that the cell does everything it can to protect that one master copy um, and just pull the information from that one master copy. And so the first step in putting the information found into uh, found in DNA into action is the process of transcription, which is making a copy of the information that is found in a piece of the DNA template. Um, so I like to tell people that if there was only one library in the world and you needed information from it, but you couldn't check out books, what would you do? Well, of course, you would go to that library and you would make a copy of the pages of that book or you take a picture of it on your phone. And that's what the cell does as well. Um, it wants to keep its one master copy safe. And so it will take pieces of that master copy, the DNA template, and it will copy them into complementary RNA. So this is like the photocopy or the um, picture that you take on your phone of the information found in the library book. And that's the basics of what happens in transcription. Then, of course, what would happen is that information would be um, taken to a different location and then put into action. So the instructions found in that book, um, the copy of that book, would be actually created. And that's what happens in translation. So the synthesis of proteins from the information that was copied during transcription is what happens in translation. So to recap... DNA is the one and only master copy. This is like the library. Transcription is the act of making a photocopy of the DNA into the form of RNA. And then translation is the process of taking the information, the instructions found in that RNA, and turning it into protein. So we're going to walk through step by step um, what happens in transcription. And then after that, we will talk about what happens in translation. So transcription is uh, based upon an important enzyme called RNA polymerase. Um, this is the, the one enzyme that carries out the process of the copy making that occurs during transcription. In our discussion about DNA replication earlier in this lecture, we learned about an enzyme called DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase, its role was to create new strands of DNA. So it should make sense to us that its cousin enzyme, RNA polymerase, its job is to make new strands of RNA. And the way that it does this is by attaching itself to a region of the DNA called the promoter. The promoter is the area that RNA polymerase binds to initially. It then opens up the two strands of DNA. It pulls them apart so that it can access the nitrogenous bases on either strand. And then... It reads the sequence of the nitrogenous bases on one of those strands and creates a complementary strand of RNA to that one DNA strand, as you see happening in this animation here. So we can see the process of this big blob RNA polymerase opening the strands and building an RNA complement as it moves through the piece of DNA. So the DNA, again, this is like the library book, and then the RNA strand that is being composed, this is like the photocopy of the library book that is a temporary conduit for that information. The reason why we call this messenger RNA 
um, or mRNA is because that piece of RNA is conveying a message. So it's a, it's a temporary copy that carries the message stored in the library book to a different location where that message will be put into action. Before the message is put into action, however, in some types of organisms, there's an intervening step called RNA splicing. This process only occurs in eukaryotic organisms, not prokaryotic organisms. So in the world of microbiology, RNA splicing is only relevant to helminths, fungi, algae. Uh, prokaryotes like bacteria and archaea do not carry out RNA splicing, so keep that in mind. What RNA splicing is, is the removal of certain sections of that messenger RNA called introns, and then the sealing up of the remaining exons, which in this animation right here, the introns are shown as yellow lengths of messenger RNA, and the exons are shown as red lengths of messenger RNA. As you can see, the yellow bits get cut out, and the red bits are left behind. And we can kind of think about this as like, um, if you go to the library and you make your photocopy, uh, and then before you take it home, you sit there and you cross out the pieces that you don't like. Maybe you made a copy of um, a recipe for spaghetti, for example. Um, and there's some steps in that process of making spaghetti that you are not interested in doing. And so you cross those steps out. What remains are the exons that are spliced back together. So now at this point, we've walked through what happens in transcription, and we've talked about the intervening step of RNA splicing that only applies to eukaryotic organisms. All that's left is for us to discuss translation which, remember, is the process of taking that RNA copy, the messenger RNA, and actually putting it into action, so using it as instructions for making a protein. So what we're going to be doing is actually switching languages. We've been talking about DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, being transformed into RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, but now we're actually going to be taking the information in that ribonucleic acid and turning it into a protein, which is a whole new language compared to the nucleic acids that we've been working in so far. We learned previously in this lecture that DNA and RNA are both comprised of building blocks called nucleotides, but you tell me, what are the building blocks of proteins called? So hopefully we all came up with amino acids. Um, amino acids is the name of the building block of a protein molecule. And there are 20 different amino acids that exist in nature. Um, they can be categorized into different groups depending upon their uh, chemical character. There are nonpolar amino acids, there are polar amino acids, and there are electrically charged amino acids. Uh, a detailed discussion of the significance of these three different groups is beyond the scope of our class here. Um, but what we need to know is that in order to make proteins, one of the ingredients that goes into the process of translation is raw amino acids, because these are the building blocks of proteins. So the ingredients that, that are needed for translation to take place are, of course, the instruction manual, the messenger RNA or the mRNA that came out of transcription is necessary to make the protein because this is the guide for how the protein is made. We also, as we just said, need amino acids. Amino acids are the raw material that makes up the protein, um, and these are delivered to the translation process by a special class of RNA molecules called transfer RNA, or tRNA, as it is abbreviated. More on that in a second. And we also need a structure called a ribosome. Now we learned about ribosomes briefly previously. Um, we learned that the role of ribosomes in the cell is to make proteins. Um, and so now we're going to actually see how that process is carried out. Ribosomes are big complexes of RNA and also proteins, um, which are responsible for carrying out the process of translation. We can think about these guys as kind of being like big protein factories. So this is where the process of translation takes place. The messenger RNA is read and then turned into a protein inside of the ribosome here. Transfer RNA, or tRNA molecules, um, as we mentioned, are the amino acid uh, delivery mechanism for translation. 
And we can kind of think about tRNA molecules as being the bilingual translators of the cell. And that's because they can read nucleic acids, but they can write amino acids. So at one end of the transfer RNA, there is a site where the amino acid is carried. And at the other end of the transfer RNA molecule, there is a special set of three nucleotides um, that's more important than the other nucleotides found in the transfer RNA. And these three nucleotides are called the anticodon. Now this whole piece right here that composes the transfer RNA, this is one long strand of RNA that has double bonded to itself um, at three or four different points um, along the strand. And what's really important is that these three particular letters here um, are, are what the transfer RNA uses to read and decode the letters that are found in the messenger RNA. So in this particular transfer RNA, we can see that the anticodon here reads C, G, G. And so what will happen is every time in the messenger RNA, the ribosome finds the complement of this, which is G, C, C, it will call up the appropriate transfer RNA molecule and it will attach, it will stick the codon here to the anticodon and drop off the appropriate amino acid into the growing protein. And cells have a supply of transfer RNA molecules that have every possible anticodon, every possible set of three nucleotides down here um, for, for the appropriate amino acid. So here's what all the possible different sets of three letters are that might show up in a messenger RNA and how the transfer RNAs decode them. So for example, if in the messenger RNA there is a set of letters that reads G, U, G, then a transfer RNA will be brought into the ribosome that is carrying the amino acid valine, and that will be added to the protein at that point. Or if there is a set of three letters that pops up in the messenger RNA um, that goes A, A, C, then a transfer RNA that is carrying the amino acid asparagine will arrive at the ribosome and drop off its amino acid. And so the point of all of this is that um, the messenger RNA is read by the ribosome in sets of three letters, and those three letters are decoded by the transfer RNA molecules into amino acids. So I want you guys to practice how this works um, so that, that you can fully understand it. Let's say that our messenger RNA read the following sequence of letters. And remember, the way that the ribosome reads this is in sets of three. And so the ribosome will divide this up into sets of three-letter words, A-U-G, G-U-G, so on. Each three-letter word is called a codon. And then the ribosome will find the tRNA that matches each codon and bring its own specific amino acid to the picture. So in this case, AUG gets decoded into methionine, GUG gets decoded into valine, CAC gets decoded into histidine, and so on. So I want you guys to give this a shot. Um, I have a different sequence of letters up here. What I want you to do is take the sequence of letters, divide it up into codons or sets of three letter words, and then I will show you the amino acid table on the next slide pause there and do the job of the ribosome, uh, decode the information in this messenger RNA into a sequence of amino acids that makes up the protein. And here is the amino acid decoding chart. So now we're going to uh, just take a little look here at an animation that shows how this process works. Um, so what we're looking at here is the process of translation being uh, carried out inside of a ribosome, which is the large brown blob that you see in the background. We can see that the messenger RNA is being threaded through the ribosome and that the ribosome is bringing in a matching tRNA molecule 
for every set of three letters that happens to pass through the ribosome. And as those tRNA molecules enter the ribosome, they carry those purple amino acids, and the amino acids get added to the chain that eventually becomes a protein. So the growing protein is this thing that you see uh, hanging off the end of the tRNA molecules here. So I've done my best to show you um, animations of these processes happening on our previous slides, um, but the video that you see linked here actually includes transcription and translation happening together in sequence. Um, so I encourage you to go to the slides um, and again, click on this YouTube link and take a look at this video because it shows you the continuous process of transcription to translation. Um, the only thing that I advise you to do before watching this video is keep in mind that this is showing the process as it happens in eukaryotic cells, which of course means that uh, they will be referencing the existence of a nucleus inside of the cell. Prokaryotic cells don't have that. Uh, and they will also be describing the process of RNA splicing, which doesn't happen in prokaryotic cells. So keep that in mind when you're watching this video is that it is transcription and translation as it happens in eukaryotes, not in prokaryotes. So let's go back to that idea that the DNA is a library full of different sets of instructions um, and take a look at a few different examples of prokaryotic species um, and the, the size of the libraries that they have. So Staphylococcus aureus, for example, S. aureus, is a species that we've been working with in our laboratory, and it its genome is estimated to contain 2,700 protein coding genes, or in other words, genes that represent an instruction manual for making a protein. So that's quite a lot. Vibrio cholerae has even more. It has 3,900 protein coding genes. Um, Bacillus subtilis has 4,400. Escherichia coli has 4,300. So this is a lot for a little cell. Um, and my question that I pose to you is, do you think that every single one of these instruction manuals is being followed and carried out 100% of the time? Is every gene in every cell being transcribed and translated all the time? The answer to this question should be no. Um, and the reason why is because that would be a waste. You can imagine that in the library, there are so many different um, pieces of information that are not always at all times necessary for the cell survival. There are some genes that are necessary to be continuously transcribed and translated for the cell to survive, and these are called constitutive genes. So constitutive genes are continuously expressed as part of normal cellular operations. These genes encode essential proteins that are being continuously transcribed and translated um, because they are needed all of the time. The counterpart to constitutive genes are facultative genes. So facultative genes are genes that are expressed only when the cell needs them, um, when the environment dictates that they are necessary to be produced. And based upon our best estimate from microbiologists today, Somewhere between 60 to 80% of genes are constitutive within a prokaryote, depending upon the species. And the rest of the genes are facultative, so produced at one time, but not at other times. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about facultative genes and how the cell carries out a mechanism for turning them on at some times and turning them off at other times. And this mechanism is called the operon theory. So let's define what an operon is. An operon is a group of genes that are all related to each other in functionality that are transcribed together and controlled by the same promoter. So if we take a look at the anatomy of an operon right here, the whole operon is this section of DNA. And within the operon, there is what is called the control region and the control region is basically like the on-off switch for the rest of the genes. So these genes are the instruction manual, and this control region is what dictates whether or not the instruction manual is going to be read by the cell and actually used at any given time. 
Within the control region, there are two separate sections. There is the promoter first and the operator second. And as we learned before, the promoter is the region where RNA polymerase binds. Remember, RNA polymerase creates a molecule of messenger RNA during the process of transcription. So RNA polymerase is the photocopier. This is the enzyme that, that actually makes the molecule of RNA from the instruction manual. And the promoter is where that enzyme is able to attach to the gene. The operator comes after the promoter. It is sandwiched in between the promoter and the stuff that needs to be copied. And we can kind of think as the, of the operator as like uh, the traffic light for RNA polymerase. So the operator is going to control whether or not RNA polymerase is going to stop here or go all the way through to copy the structural genes. So let's take a look at an example of an operon that is really well understood by microbiologists. And that is the LAC operon in E. coli. So the LAC operon consists of three different genes, Z, Y, and A, that are all under the control of the same promoter and operator here. So in other words, when one of these genes gets translated and transcribed, all of them get translated and transcribed because they are all under the control of the same traffic light and RNA polymerase here. The Z gene in the LAC operon encodes instructions for the enzyme beta-galactosidase. And beta-galactosidase is an enzyme that E. coli can use to metabolize lactose. Lactose is a sugar that E. coli can use as an energy source, but it is not normally a sugar that E. coli likes to use, only sometimes. And so E. coli does not normally um, have to make these, these special enzymes for metabolizing and digesting lactose, only when lactose is its only source of energy that is available will it do so. The Y gene encodes lac permease. Lac permease is an enzyme that is responsible for transporting lactose into the cell. And so we can see we have related functions here. We have digesting lactose, but then we also have uh, bringing lactose into the cell. And then the A gene encodes an enzyme called transacetylase. And transacetylase is actually not a very well understood enzyme at this point, um, but there is evidence that it is involved in the metabolism of other disaccharides that may accompany lactose when the cell is exposed to it. So there are two different types of operons, and you can probably guess what which one E. coli lac operon is based upon my description that I just gave you. Um, there are some operons that are normally turned off, and in order for them to function, they must be turned on. And these ones are called inducible operons because they must be induced to be transcribed and translated. So the baseline state of the inducible operon is off, and something has to happen to the cell in order for it to be turned on. The counterpart to the inducible operon is the repressible operon, and the repressible operon is normally on and has to be turned off. So the baseline state of a repressible operon is on and something has to happen to the cell in order for it to be shut down. So which one do you think the E. coli lac operon is? Is it inducible or is it repressible? Well, I just told you that E. coli can digest lactose, but it does not always digest lactose. Only when lactose is its sole source of available nutrition will it make the enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing lactose. And so it should make sense to you that the E. coli lac operon is an inducible operon because E. coli does not always need the enzymes that are involved in lactose metabolism. Only when they are necessary does it make them. So the baseline state of the E. coli lac operon is that it is turned off by a repressor protein. Normally, there is a protein that sits on the operator and physically blocks RNA polymerase from reaching the Z, Y, and A genes. This, of course, prevents the RNA polymerase from transcribing and copying these instructions, which then prevents the downstream creation 
of any sort of protein or enzyme from those instructions. Here's what has to happen in order for Z, Y, and A to actually be transcribed and expressed. So when lactose is present in the cell's environment, then a derivative of lactose called allolactose diffuses into the interior of the cell, and it actually physically attaches itself to the protein, which is blocking the operator region here, thereby changing its shape and causing it to pop off of the operator. This, of course, gives RNA polymerase the green light to proceed through the operator and into the Z, Y, and A genes, where it will copy them, transcribe them, which allows them to then be translated into the appropriate proteins. So that was an example of an inducible operon. Let's now talk about an example of a repressible operon. So remember, the repressible operon is one that is normally on, and something has to happen to the cell in order for it to be turned off. And a great example of a well-understood repressible operon is the TRP operon, or the TRIP operon, also found in E. coli. And this operon consists of five different genes here that are all related to the synthesis of an important amino acid called tryptophan. And all five of these genes, just like in the LAC operon, are under the control of the same control region, so the same promoter and the same operator. So it's important that the cell has a constant supply of the amino acid tryptophan. And therefore, the baseline state of the TRIP operon is that it is always on. So RNA polymerase is normally able to attach to the promoter, proceed uninhibited through the operator, and transcribe the five genes that encode enzymes that make tryptophan for the cell. However, if the cell starts to produce too much tryptophan and it wants to shut down the production caused by this transcription process, then tryptophan itself will attach to a special protein which turns into the repressor for the trip operon. So the tryptophan attaches to the protein, it changes its shape, and becomes active at attaching to the operator and physically blocking RNA polymerase from accessing these genes and making more tryptophan. So let's make sure that you guys understand the difference between inducible and repressible operons with this checkpoint. In E. coli, there is another operon called the L. arabinose operon, which contains three genes that encode enzymes for breaking down a different sugar called arabinose. And these genes are only transcribed when arabinose is present in the environment of the cell. Otherwise, the baseline state for the operon is off. So tell me, is the L. arabinose operon inducible or is it rep repressible? And once you complete this checkpoint, that is the end of this lecture.